what I do know is um, when I, well, I, I really met them at the Jesus Conference, and we all fell in love with them there, everybody who went. But um, since then, I have had the privilege of seeing them at different places. And, um, and I, I have said this before, but those of you who have not heard me say it, when Pastor Theo speaks, he brings such a tenderness of intimacy with God. And that is what everyone needs, that tenderness and that intimacy with God. And so if you will just open up your heart and your spirit and let everything else go, we are going to have a blessed day. And also, um, Miss Rachel, would you like to say something to the people? Okay, come on. And, and can we see your cute kids too? We love them so much. Come on, guys. Are they not the cutest? Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Come, on. Come on. They're so cute. I told them this is in our church, so they actually have to behave. Oh, no, that's <laughs> right. We love kids. It's okay. They can come or not come. It's all right. I don't want to embarrass you, but I, I love kids, and I love you, and so we wanted to welcome you. And so why don't you tell us their names? And okay. This is Theo, my oldest. He's 10. Hi, Theo. Hi, Theo. He's an amazing young man. And this is Henry, our monkey in the middle. He's six. Aww. And Caleb, Judah, is three. That's our baby. Aww. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, we're so happy to be here. Thank you guys for having us. I don't really like to speak too much. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Okay, are you all mic'd? You want a handheld? Welcome, Pastor Theo. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I count it the highest honor any time I have the opportunity to talk to anybody about Jesus and uh, to be received into the house the way we have. I want to thank you so much. It means a lot to us. Um, we, we're in the process of uh, building a church. We're in year two, and we're in the middle of a building project. So I'm walking in here getting ideas and what you guys have done with the building and it's amazing that uh, you guys have uh, what you have here, something special and precious. And uh, I'm honored to be a part of it, and I'm honored to fellowship with you guys this morning. Could I get uh, Rach or Hannah up there? I just want to fix our hearts on the Lord, and let's just see what he's going to do. Lord, we've come today to, to meet with you. It's the only reason we're here. It's just simply to be with you. So, Lord, I thank you for everything that you've done in me. I thank you for everything that you're doing in this house. We're a grateful people. Many today gather in no sense of your presence. What a privilege it is to gather knowing you're in the midst of us. But, Lord, we want to just let you know. You're free to be you. Talk how you want to talk and move how you want to move. We open up our hearts to you. Holy Spirit, not only the great comforter, but the great teacher, the great unveiler of the Lord, the one who rips our hearts open to receive the word of God, the one who points out Jesus in the midst of a crowd, the one who embraces us, provides us peace that surpasses every bit of understanding. We welcome your presence. We need you. We can't do this without you. We can't worship the Lord without you. We can't talk about Jesus without you. We completely yield our lives to you now. Sickness be healed. Depression flee. Soundness of mind coming all while the word of the Lord is being released. Marriage is being restored. 
spouses coming to the Lord, and children coming to Jesus. I speak strength into this house. I speak strength into this house. A grace that will propel you to a place you've never been before. Don't get weary. Be strengthened in the Lord. The future is much brighter than the past. We go from glory to glory. Victory to victory. What was was wonderful. But what is and what will be will be greater. We release it over this house. The tangible presence of the Lord. The tangible presence of Jesus will be found here. The city will want to know where do they need to go to experience God. This will be that place. People running with their sickness here running to a city on a hill, lit up with the glory of God. Though it may be hidden to a certain extent, whatever's hidden will be revealed in due season. And I believe, Lord, you're beginning to illuminate this house for such a time as this. And as a result, Lord Jesus, our main responsibility is to lift you up, and you've made a promise that you would draw all men to yourself. We lift you up this morning. We give you glory. We love you. We bless you. And we worship you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said. You see how quick. Keep playing, Hannah. You see how quick you you can just fix your heart in a direction and you're there. He, He makes himself so easy to be found. It, 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 even in the aspect of seeking and searching and knocking and digging, in the end, he's just desiring for us to enjoy the the amazing privilege we have in finding him. He doesn't hide himself from us in seasons he could hide himself for us. It's different. He wants us to enjoy the journey, but he also wants to, us to enjoy the finding. I got a, a promise to make to each of you today. All of you, if you want, will encounter Jesus today in a fresh new way. He doesn't come as a spectator. He, he's here. He's, he's in the center. He's in the midst. He, he will travel through rows and aisles and chairs and pews, and he'll touch those here because that's just what he does. And what really draws him to your life is hunger. So all you got to do is get a taste of Jesus. Just a taste. Once the taste settles on the palate of your soul, you'll never be the same again. But for those of us who have never tasted Jesus, we don't understand how good he is until we've actually tasted the goodness of God. I'm not talking about tasting church. I'm talking about tasting the living bread. Talk about tasting Jesus. I'm also not talking about encountering him through your pastor or through the leaders of this church. I often tell my people, he's not a a second-hand Jesus. I'm not trying to get you to know him through me. I mean, I want to point you in that direction, but the goal and the objective of my life is to put you with a face-to-face encounter with God in yourself. He becomes your Jesus. He steps into your mess. He reveals his goodness to you. Then and only then can we say, look what the Lord has done. Not look what the Lord has done for him, look what the Lord has done for her, but look what the Lord has done for me. If you haven't had one of those moments, this could be the very moment you've been desiring. And all you have to do is say, Jesus, come. Just come. I've never understood why some people will hold on so tightly to their life when they're miserable doesn't even make sense to me like they're depressed they're miserable they're unhappy but they hold on to it 
Jesus is coming and saying, listen, I'm coming to give you life. I want to take that depression, turn it into joy. I want to take your brokenness and make it whole. Just come to me. I'm, I'm unlike any other person you've ever met. Just come to me. And people still struggle with the fact of reaching out to a hand that's extended to them because they're not willing to let go of the life that they hate. They hate it. How about today we just simply let go and let God? Just let go. Let go of pain. Let go of rejection. Let go of storms. Let go of those bills. Let go of that report. And let's just fix our eyes on the solution. Can we do that just for a few minutes? I want us to read this morning coming out of Mark chapter 14. And hopefully we can paint a picture. I don't know, I don't know who you are, um, but there's a crazy destiny on you, man. No, I mean that. I, I, I think that there's, your future is, is massive and, and pain has kept you locked. But the Lord wants to deal with your pain today. I really feel it wholeheartedly. He's going to reveal himself to you. He's not like anything you've ever seen and not like the people who've hurt you in the past. He wants to reveal his goodness to you, man, because there's a bright, 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 bright future ahead of you. While I was worshiping, I couldn't. Is this your son? Yeah, there's something really amazing on you. Don't let go. The Lord's going to deal with your pain today. I had to have one of those encounters. What kept me from my future often, what keeps many people from their future is pain. And um, we've had this idea, and I think maybe just because the church has been so religious. I hate religion, just so y'all know. So some of y'all might get offended by me, but that's okay. Uh, because, you know, honestly, man, I'm, I'm looking for the real deal. Uh, I'm not looking for the put-together perfect scenario. I, I want the real deal. I want the Jesus who gets in the mess of the prostitute like he got in the mess of me. You know what I mean? This, the, where's that Jesus today? I mean, we're, we're really making a word, world feel like, my God. Like until they clean up on the outside, they can't come on the inside. It's just, it's bizarre to me. Uh, give me give me the mess. Give me the rejects. Give me the outcast. That's what I want because Jesus was a friend of them. I was one of those. I was on the streets of Tampa living a horrible life. My kids are here, so I won't go into the details. But I was an absolute, the worst of the worst sinners you could possibly think of. You know, and, and the church never came into the streets to get me. They waited for me to come to them. I don't know Jesus to be that. Jesus stepped down from heaven to invade earth and to invade the circumstances of people's lives. He didn't wait for people to come to heaven. Heaven came to earth. And so I have a heart and a real deep passion for people to encounter Jesus in the mess of their life. Because there's going to have to be a testimony associated to your conversion. When I was blind, he met me on a road. Do you get what I'm saying? Like there has to be some sense in your life where you look at the timeline of your life and you say, that was the moment where he plucked me out of that circumstance. I'm all for people coming to church. I'm a pastor. But I want, I want Jesus. You know, we have uh, homosexuals that come into the church. And, and, you know, it's amazing to me. It's like, I'll never forget we had this, uh, a couple come in, and um, these, these two females, and, and they were being tormented with devils. And they didn't know where to turn, so they came to the church because they figured that we could pray for them. And man, it was amazing. It was as if the entire church stayed around to see what I was going to do at the altar. Like, what's he going to do? Is he going to pray for him? Should he call him out? Should we throw some? It's almost like people began to pick up their stones. You know, people began to pick up their stones. And in that moment, I had an opportunity just to be honest with them. Here's the deal. I can get those things out of you. We can do that. That's not a problem. But with any life you accept, there's a byproduct associated to the confession and the life you choose. If you choose darkness, unfortunately, this is the life that comes with it. If you choose Jesus, freedom comes with it. It's your choice to make. I can't make that decision for you. But either way, whether you accept Jesus or you decide to remain in your current lifestyle, I love you. Jesus' love is not conditional, folks. 
he didn't wait for the world to get right before he came to express his love. The Bible, if I'm clear, says that while we were sinners, he died for us. That while we were sinners, he expressed his love toward us. How about we love people into freedom? How about that? How about we love people? What, let, let's just think about this. What caused you to say yes to Jesus? You forget who you were? You forget where you came from? It's the craziest thing. People get saved and all of a sudden they start pointing fingers at the streets they once walked on. Cursing the very bars that they were in. How about instead of cursing the bar, how about you step into the bar and pluck people out like Jesus did for you? We're praying from a distance now. It's like now we're in church and we just stretch our hands toward the streets we came from. How about you step on the street now that you have the love and the light of God and illuminate that place of darkness so they can experience the same thing you experience? Do you get what I'm trying to say? I'm just looking for some real people this morning. Do you get it? So that's what we're going to go. I, 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 I'm just, I believe that there is a world that is crying out for Jesus. And I believe the solution resides within us. Christ in me, the hope of glory. And many people have been praying And the solution to their prayer is you. Lord, help me. Could be a co-worker. Lord, help me. Help me. I need need you right now. And and many times we're so busy doing what we're doing and we're busy walking by and shundying over their cubicle that they would get saved and that something would happen instead of just stopping and turning in. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk about how Jesus stops and turns in. Does that sound good? All right, let's do Mark. Mark chapter 14. I'm good, Hannah. Thank you, baby. Mark chapter 14, verse 1. I, I want to try to paint a picture. When, when, when we uh, minister at the church and we have an amazing team with us, that's sweet baby D right there. He don't look like it, but he is a sweet baby D. Stand up, sweet baby D. Let him see all that sweet baby D. That's sweet baby D. Yeah, so we got Toby here. And this is uh, an associate, my associate pastor. This is Mikey. This is Pastor Mikey right there. This is um, our assistant in everything. He does everything. And he's going to be my brother-in-law because he's marrying my sister-in-law. And it's his birthday today. So his name, is, yeah, his name is Josh. Let's sing happy birthday to Josh. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Yeah, buddy. Enjoying it? Yeah. So we uh, we roll. We like to try to roll deep if we can. Um, I don't know if they got muscles like the rolling deep back in the day, like they can protect me. But uh, I don't think they can do that. But but they're amazing, and uh, we love serving Jesus together. Amen. You know, there there is a form of leadership that some of us have come out out uh, from, which is positional leadership which is the title that says, hey, I'm above you. You got to do what I got to do. But I'm for all, all for relational leadership. When Jesus wanted to develop leaders, he didn't say, go and do this first. He said, come and follow me. Let's do this thing together. Let's, let's follow Jesus together. So we like to kind of do it as a family. And obviously, that's why my kids are here. I want my kids to experience the journey that Jesus has us on. Um, I want them to see Jesus moving and all those kind of things. My my middle guy right here plays the drums with his mom, and my oldest is preaching, and uh, my youngest is just beating the two of them up. <laughs> but uh, we try to do this thing together. All right, let's turn into Mark chapter 14. Two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the leading priests and religious scholars were committed to finding a way to secretly arrest Jesus and have him executed. But they all agreed that their plot could not succeed, and if they carried it out during the days of the feast, for they said there could be a riot among the people. Verse 3. Now Jesus was in Bethany. Everyone say Bethany. Bethany. In the home of Simon, a man Jesus had healed of leprosy. And he was reclining at the table, and a woman came into the house. Everyone say came into the house. Holding an alabaster flask. It was filled with the highest quality of fragrant and expensive oil. She walked right up to Jesus, and with a gesture of extreme devotion, everyone say extreme devotion, she broke the flask and poured it out, poured out the precious oil over his head. 
But there was those, but some were highly indignant when they saw this. And they complained to one another, saying, What a total waste. Isn't that amazing? It could have been sold for a great sum of money and could have been used to benefit the poor. So they scolded her harshly. Now Jesus stands up. I love this. Defends her. Jesus said to them, Leave her alone. Why are you so critical of this woman? She has honored me with this beautiful act of kindness. For you will always have the poor, whom you can help whenever you want, but you will not always have me. When she poured the fragrant oil over me, she was prepping my body in advance for my burial. She has done all that she could do to honor me. I promise you, at this one, as this wonderful gospel spreads all over the world, the story of her lavish devotion to me will be mentioned in memory of her. The word Bethany, we, we know as house of dates. So there's a, there's a good connotation to the word Bethany. But when I was studying, and in the Strong's, the actual the Strong's concordance also says house of misery which is kind of a, it's weird. How could there be a positive and a negative in one expression of a city? Until you know Jesus when he turns all things for good, then it kind of makes sense. But in this scenario, I want to paint a picture, and I want us to use the, I want us to use that aspect of the house of misery to understand the scenario here. We understand that Jesus is at the house, and he is Simon the leper, the scripture references him as. Now, we don't know exactly how long he had the leprosy. We don't know if the leprosy started in that home. But more than likely, if even if he had to move out of that house, the fact was this. If that was his home, and he recognized that there was leprosy in there, nobody was ever going to walk towards Simon the leper's house. Now, if in fact he was living in that house, then it's also important to understand that more than likely there was the, the scent of death coming from that house prior to Jesus invading his life. So people kind of stay away from that. It's amazing to me how Jesus always turns in to miserable situations and he turns in to find rest in the places we often avoid. Think of this. Bethany was also a place where you'll find Jesus resting, relaxing, and feasting. Now for us, the last place that we're going to turn into is a sick, dysfunctional situation. We find that to be taxing on our body. We avoid uncomfortable situations. We, we avoid miserable scenarios. We, we avoid people's issues. We avoid people's problems. We try to steer clear of them. No, you don't want to get caught up in that mess. The fact is we always kind of keep things at a distance. Simon the leper, he's over there. Yeah, let's go on the other street. I don't want to mess with that. But for, for Jesus, what's crazy to us is the messier the issue is, the quicker he turns in, and the place we avoid is the place he prefers. Think of it. The place he prefers is often the place we avoid. He turns in to misery. That's why I tell people, please don't hide your mess. You, you want Jesus to turn into your life? Don't hide your mess. Seriously, open up the door and say, Jesus, I am jacked up. I, I, I have mess after mess. My, my marriage is a mess. I'm not going to go out of, outside the house and smile and act like everything's okay. It's not okay. I, I'm not going to act as though everything's all put together inside the house, and we're going to have to fake it on the outside, and, and because I can't let people l- really know exactly what's going on in my life, in my heart, and, and, and where I'm at right now, because people will reject me. Yeah, people will reject you, for sure. That's just the way people are wired. The messier the situation, the quicker we avoid it. But Jesus isn't like the people that you, you know. Jesus is not like anyone else on earth. When Jesus sees mess, he turns in. That's, that's exciting to me 
because then I realized that the only reason I'm here today is because Jesus turned into my mess and made a miracle. Many of us would pass by this city of misery, but he's looking to turn in. He's looking to turn into your, anx- your, your anxiety, your brokenness, your burdens, your cares, your scars, your discouragement, your discomfort, your gloom, your hardship, your harassment, your sickness, your stain, your torment, and your pain. Jesus wants in. He wants in. The, 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 the title to this uh, message is, It Makes No Sense. It makes no sense. And I had a graphic uh, at the church, but it makes no sense. But if you are taking notes, you could put it makes no sense. And where it actually have the word sense, you can put a line through that and also put sent. S-C-E-N-T. We're going to get to that. Much of what Jesus does makes no sense. But there is a scent that's being released from the house of Simon the leper. Sin of death. Jesus turns in, and he changes the very fragrance of his life. Jesus turns in, and he uses this home as a place where he can relax and feast. We know that this home is also being used to honor the Lord. There's a woman that Mark doesn't give a name to, which I don't understand how Mark doesn't give a name to it. John does, but the fact that Mark doesn't blows my mind, being that we're going to be talking about her forever. I don't know if they had some woman issues still when they were writing it, but the fact is is that Mark neglects to provide the details that John provides and leaves her name out. So we're going to kind of just keep her as a no-name woman right now. As Jesus is in the house of Simon the leper, there's a no-name woman walking down the street from her house. And I want us to picture this now. She's, she's approaching the house of Simon, the house that people avoided. Now people are being drawn to because Jesus is in there. The house that once smelt like death now begins to smell like the most amazing baked bread and Middle Eastern food coming from that house. So you gotta, you got to picture that, man, when you read the scriptures, you got to jump in the scene. you got to get there. So uh, uh, it's amazing how Jesus can even change the fragrance of that house to a place you're being drawn to. And as, he, as she begins to walk up to this house, she's simply being led by the fragrance in the house. Now, the first fragrance that was being released from there would be death. But now there's another fragrance being released, and that fragrance is known as fellowship. Some people can come to church, you've gone from death to life, but you can come to church and the only thing that you're desiring to release from your life is simply the fragrance of fellowship, which is good, but it's not the highest fragrance to be released. As she comes to the door, she has something in her hand because she came into her house carrying a gift. She knocks on the door. Somebody opens up the door. And the first thing that we see in the scripture is she notices Jesus reclining at a table. Now, I want us to understand that Jesus is reclining at the table in Simon the leper's house. The moment that she comes in, she sees him reclining, leaning, resting, and feasting. When she comes into the presence of the Lord, she comes with a gift. Now, this isn't about money, but if, if, if the shoe fits, wear it. But many of us come into the presence with nothing to release, only to receive. I'm all for people who don't know Jesus coming in to simply receive. But for those of us who know him, for those of us who've tasted him, for those of us who have an idea of what he's done and who he is, we cannot afford to come into the presence of God empty-handed. Even since he was a baby, the wise men, who weren't even Christians, and no one was Christian until after anyways, they discerned. This is the king. 
I can't come into his presence empty-handed. She had a revelation of who it was in the house of Simon the leper, and she was going to provide him a gift. Not just any gift, and an extravagant gift. A gift that made no sense. A gift that caused people in the room to say, hold up, you've wasted that. You're bringing that to the Lord? Do you know what that could have done for the poor? Judas loves to say those kind of things. Just simply because he'd have been the one to make sure that he divvied it up to the poor. And more than likely, the poor would have got a cut, and so would he. Many people are very hypocritical, judgmental, I should say critical and judgmental, When they begin to see somebody blessed over here, they begin to point the finger and tell them what they should do with their money, but the people who are often pointing the finger don't have money themselves. Can we just break that kind of stuff? You don't want to be a critical person. How about celebrate someone else's blessing? You know what I mean? Point and be like, celebrate it. My God, Lord, thank you for blessing them. If you did it for them, you can do it for me. And as she walks in, he's, he's, he's leaning. Now, this is the posture that we are to to have in our life, where we are leaning, resting, and feasting. We get this because John, we're going to see, also is the one who is leaning into the bosom of the Lord. Now, that's the posture that people are to take around the table, but it's also the posture we are to abide in. But you'll never be able to rest and never be able to lean into God until you know he loves you. See, the only people who can rest, lean, relax, and feast are those that know they're loved. I'm all for spiritual warfare. I believe in it. But I believe some people have jumped out with their swords in hand to try to fight a devil before they've even allowed the Lord to solidify in their heart they're loved. And it's dangerous. When Jesus created Adam and Eve, he did not teach them how to fight. The devil was there. He was in the garden. Now think of this. Your father, I'm going to put my kids onto a playground where there's a bully. You think I'm going to teach my kid how to fight? Absolutely. I'm not going to let him just jump on that playground until he can know how to handle himself. But Jesus did not, the father did not teach Adam how to fight. He taught him how to walk and stand. Walk with me. Who does the fighting for us? Okay. Who's our warrior? Not you. You think you can, you think you can beat the devil up? <laughs> Have any of y'all ever had a demonic encounter? I've been choked out of my body in Puerto Rico preaching, in bed the first night, all by myself. Next thing you know, something grabs me by my throat, pulls me up. I'm looking at my body in bed looking at my body and being choked. The only thing that protected me was me getting the name of Jesus out of my mouth. The moment I called on the lamb, the moment I called on the warrior, he came in, boom, my body was dropped back in there, but I was like, what? I could not sleep that night at all. But we've been taught to rest, recline, and feast in his love. See, I understand this. I'm victorious because of what he's done. My responsibility in warfare is this. I stand in who I am. I stand in it. I don't have armor on the back. I'm never turning my back. I don't retreat. I'm advancing forward. But I'm not the one winning the battle. The battle's been won. I say it like this. Jesus is the only person who wins the race and tells us to jump on the lap, the the track for the victory lap. It's like, it's ridiculous. It's like, wait, wait, wait. You did this whole thing. Now you want me to run the victory lap? Yeah, that's how I roll. That's, that's how we do it. So, so for us, it's like we need to be able to take the posture that Jesus has in this moment of leaning in and resting and relaxing. There's no weapon formed against me that can prosper. I am a son. You're a daughter of God. I am loved by God. That's why when Jesus was in the garden, I mean, when Jesus, after the baptism, the heavens were ripped open, they said, this is my beloved son. When Satan came to tempt Jesus... Satan, not like devils that most of us deal with. I'm talking about the real deal, the real deal. 
he's not omnipresent, people. He's only one place at one time. You're not fighting Satan. I can promise you that. Many of you have never fought Satan. Jesus is looking Satan in the eyes. And this is, what the, this is what Satan does to try to get him to fall into temptation. If you're the son of God. Well, that's not what the Lord said. The Lord said before he went in to be tempted, this is my beloved son. Satan knew if I can strip the aspect of him knowing he is loved, I might have a chance to beat him and defeat him. If you don't know that you're loved, I promise you this, it's only time before you're defeated. Because the only thing for you to be secure in and rest in is his love for you. Therefore, I can walk through valleys. I don't stay in them. I walk through them. I can get right through them because I know he loves me. Whether I'm on the mountaintop or in the valley, he loves me. That can't change. He's for me. He's not against me. And he's with me. And he loves me. Therefore, that's the stance I take. All I'm told to do is walk with God. There's opposition and there's, there's whatever, what fight. Hey, there, there are some devils that are absolutely trying to come after me. But the fact is this, is my victory is found in the one who stands with me. Do you get what I'm saying? It's like we just need to teach people who they are. Because what can happen is if you don't know that you're loved, you're going to spend your life trying to fight things and only growing weary in your own strength. And in the end, once you're weary, you will fall. But if you can be... You can stand on his love for you. You're going to find yourself hiding behind your dad. And as you hide behind your dad and you advance, he takes care of everything for you. You can, you can point out things. You can call out things. But the only reason that they even listen is the fact we have one name. It's not in your strength. And it's not in your might. And it's not in your name. It is in his name. Side note. Okay, so Jesus is leaning in there. As she comes in, she begins to pour the oil on him. Now, the question that I had when, we, when I began to study this is, what would cause her to be so extravagant in her worship? And, and at the same token, maybe this is the key why people hold on to being extravagant in their generosity. Maybe there's a key here in a principle that we can find when you're looking at someone who's willing to do anything and everything for God, but then you find others who aren't willing to do so much and they're limited in their generosity, what was the difference between that person and a Mary? There had to be a reason why she was so generous. We find out in John. First of all, her name's given in John. Second of all, she's there, and she is also the sister of Lazarus. The reason that she was willing to be so extravagant in her generosity is because she was so thankful that Jesus had raised her brother from the dead. Which tells me this, that those who hold on to things so tightly and are not extravagant are not grateful. It's an absolute byproduct for people to be generous when they have encountered the goodness of God. The only people who hold on to things tight are not grateful for what he's done. Now think of this. You have those different levels of, of we have the, 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 the aroma of, of death, now transition to the aroma of fellowship. Now as she pours out this oil, On Jesus, the aroma in the house now shifts to the highest fragrance of worship. See, some people can be in the same room and some of y'all are just releasing bread. And we like that smell. But that's not the highest form of worship to release. For those who are generous and grateful and extravagant in their worship, the fact is that life and the person next to you can be releasing two different fragrances up into the heavens. And one can be generous and expressive by not holding on to anything but giving Jesus everything. And that smells amazing in the heavens. When that oil was poured onto Jesus, Hannah, can I get it? When that oil was poured onto Jesus, I I want us to focus on this one part here. When, When she poured the oil, Mark says on his head, John talks about the feet. Either way, the oil must have run down from head to toe. Have you ever spilt oil before? You ever try to clean it up? It don't go anywhere pretty quick. When the oil is poured on his head, his body is now being absorbed with her worship. When he went to the cross... 
the fragrance of her worship did not leave. I can guarantee it was still caught up in the locks of his hair. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. This is full-blown perfume. Costly oil. I guarantee you he, you could smell Jesus from a mile away walking. You ever had someone walk by with a whole bunch of cologne and you're like, dude, two squirts too much, my man. Two squirts too much. But as he began to leave the room, there was only, a, there was only one other person that smelt like Jesus. In that entire room, there, were only one, there was only one woman that smelt like the Lord. And that was the woman who poured it out on him and wiped, wiped the oil with her hair. There were only two people in that room that were caught up in their locks and their hair were caught up with the same fragrance. Because of her act of worship, she actually smelt like Jesus. That if you closed your eyes and they walked into a room, you wouldn't know if it was Mary or Jesus. It marks his heart when you're generous. And it marks him. Think of this as, as he's on the cross and he's being nailed to a tree and he's hearing all of these horrible things about him. Could it be that maybe, I'm sure he was sustained enough by the will of the Father, so please don't think that I think that he was sustained by her worship. I'm not saying that, but could it have strengthened him in that moment? Where when his hair would be thrown in his face, it would catch the scent of her worship. The reason I said to cross out it makes no scent is because some of us are holding on to our ability to release a fragrant offering unto the Lord. You could be holding on to your life. You could be holding on to your finances. You could be holding on to a relationship. You could be holding on to a pain. You could be holding on to a trauma in your life that happened a long time ago. The only way for that to be released is for you to give it to the Lord. It's for you to pour it on Him. I can't imagine what He... All these horrible names, but all He had to do was just... But there's one that loves me. Everyone else here is against me. But, but there's one I can smell. It's still there. There's one that loves me. There's one that smells like me. There's one who gave it all for me. Held on to nothing. It marked Jesus so much that he said, as long as we preach this beautiful gospel, we're going to be talking about Mary. We're going to be talking about Mary. I want to leave that mark on his life. Hey, you could say it's pride, it's boasting. No, I love him. I want to mark his heart. I want to mark his heart to the degree in which, as long as I talk about this gospel, I'll never forget the act of worship from my buddy Theo. Guys, there's nothing to hold on to. The only one that we are to cling to is Jesus. He's the only one that can get you through your circumstance. He's the only one that can heal you of your pain. He's the only one that can invade your scenario and turn it into good. He's, he's amazing and he's here. And I don't think for us knowing that he's here, we should ever leave this situation, leave this opportunity with us not pouring something out on, on him. With every head out and eye closed. He takes 
houses of leprosy and turns them into temples of worship. He takes dead things and makes them alive. He uses Bethany's to reveal destiny. The greatest gauge to let us know if we are a grateful people is generosity. Are we generous? Now, like I said, I'm not talking about money, but money could be something. But are you generous with your time? Are you generous with your life? Do you, have you handed everything to the Lord? There's got to be something in your life that you can pour on Jesus in this moment. For hers, it was a costly perfume. I don't know what your alabaster box is. But I do know Jesus is requesting it now. Thank you for listening with the eyes of the, of the Spirit. And you would know that God is asking you. What do you have to give him that you haven't given him before? I think that whenever the Lord is moving like this there has to be a response in the in the natural in the physical as well as in the spirit Pastor Theo didn't know that we've been talking about time talent energy and finance and that these are the things that all of us have to offer this is it it's our life it represents our life to him I don't think we realize that the things we do, I hear people saying, well, I have to do this. I have to I have to clean the church. I have to do the sound. I have to. No, you don't. You get to. You offer it up to the Lord as worship. You don't even have to pay your tithes or give, but you get to. It unlocks things that are a higher level in the heavenly so you can be a receiver of things that only happen in the spiritual we talked about Mary's worship to Jesus and how it changed him he could smell it on the cross we've heard but what about what did it do to Mary When she didn't withhold anything from God, when she gave it all to him, 
What do you think our life was like? Well, we kind of know if we keep watching the book of Acts. She lived with him when he was gone. He was only gone physically. He was never gone from her spiritually. So today, Rachel's going to sing that song again. And I want you to come to the altar. You can bring your heart. You can bring your time. You can bring your talent. You can bring your energy. And you can bring your finance. As you worship him, he will meet you in this place. I believe that you can lay it all down today and your life can be transformed. Whatever holds you back can be gone, but you have to take an action. If you don't step into it, then you remain out of it. Do you understand? Okay. Rachel, would you please? And then respond. Please respond to the Spirit. Bring to Him. I I guess I want a couple ushers to put the, just put plates up here in case it's finances that they want to give. I believe that God is asking you to give more of whatever it is you have. Maybe you want to write something down. Maybe it is your time. Maybe it's, Maybe it's your worship wholeheartedly. Whatever it is, put it, bring it to the altar and let him pour back upon you. I believe that, I believe I'm healed in Jesus' name. I believe that sickness has to go as I offer to him my body as a sacrifice. So have it in your heart and have it in your mind and bring it to the Lord. Amen. I coil on your feet Like wine for you to drink Like water from my heart I'll pour my love on you With praises like perfume I lavish mine on you Till every drop is gone I'll pour my love on you Precious Jesus What else can we do For the one who gave it all for You're the one who got into my mess Like oil on your feet Like wine for you to drink Like water from my heart I'll pour my love on you If praise is like perfume i lavish mine on you Till every drop is gone I'll pour my love Like oil on your feet Like wine for you to drink Like water from my heart I'll pour my love on you If praise is like perfume I lavish mine on you
more than any other love it's true you have my heart you know you do you know you will you know you always have since i was young and little girl you can have every part of We can't even give to Jesus without him giving back to us. So 
there's such a sweet, awesome presence, a fragrance of him in the room today. So, As you love on him, he's giving you back an abundance of his love. So just breathe him in. Just take a deep breath. And breathe him in. And let his presence go to every place inside of your heart that it needs to go. Inside of your mind that it needs to go. Inside of your spirit where it needs to go. Inside of your body where it needs to go. His presence. It brings healing. It brings wholeness. It brings joy. It brings peace. This is why we love him so. We can't outgive him. We can't outlove him. Ever. He always has so much more. He always has so much more and he shares it all with his children. He's looking for grateful hearts, just grateful hearts. So we're grateful today, my Jesus. We're grateful. We love you. We love you. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. Lord, I thank you for righting every wrong, for setting every heart straight, for ordering every step. Lord, for releasing your kingdom here in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you that we are builders of the kingdom together. I thank you, Father. want to stop but we're coming back tonight so I want to give you time to rest and come back to receive amen and I don't want to wear them out I know they they came from all over so all right I love you but who do you love the most and who loves you the most and who loves them the most All right, please go share him with somebody. And I'll see you tonight, 6.30. If you would like to support this ministry with a financial contribution, visit our website at www.LibertyLifeCenter.org. Find the link to the left that says Donate Now and follow the instructions there. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing worldwide through this ministry.